Hey everyone, this is Nick, and for such a small version number change, Linux Mint 21.1 is a big, big release. Not necessarily in how you use it or its new features, but more in terms of how it looks, and it definitely looks like Windows. But of course, it also adds a ton of features that propel Linux Mint into the more modern Linux world we currently live in. So let's take a look at everything new in Mint 21.1 and let's take a look at today's sponsor. Thanks to Chasm for sponsoring this video. Chasm Workspaces lets you stream containerized apps and Linux desktops straight to your browser without anything to install. Whether you need to run a full desktop for development, use different browsers safely without compromising your own computer, or try a specific application without an install, Chasm has Linux-based images for everything. They're all open source and available directly on Docker Hub. And they even have support for any arbitrary virtual machine, including Linux, Android, Windows, and other virtual machines that can't be containerized. And they refreshed the whole user experience to be more legible and easier to use. The Chasm VNC rendering technology, which is used to stream all of this to your browser, is also open source and now supports resolutions up to 4K60. And Chasm Workspaces Community Edition can be used for self-hosting and it's available for free directly on their website. Click the link in the description below to get started with Chasm Workspaces. Okay, let's open with the elephant in the room and that's how Linux Mint looks. Mint has always looked kind of bland and old, in my opinion. That muted green with pale gray accent colors on virtually everything you hover or click, it always kind of felt stale. But green has been Mint's brand basically since it started, and it's still a huge part of its look, even on its website and logo. And, well, Mint 21.1 does away with all of that. The default look is completely different. First, the green accent color is gone. It's now a very usual blue, probably a bit lighter and more vibrant than what you would find in Gnome's Advaita, maybe more on par with KDE's Breeze. And this accent color is also used in less places. Hovering over menu items doesn't highlight them in blue, it's now kinda gray. Same goes for the panel, clicking on something doesn't turn it green anymore and the window buttons now use blue as well. The whole theme has been tweaked to be lighter on the eyes. In the file manager, for example, you don't get that big black background for the side panel. It's now pale gray, and selectors and buttons also now use gray instead of the accent color. Even selecting a folder or file in that file manager only highlights the name of the item and not the whole icon. And speaking of icons, gone are the colored folders, now they're your basic manila yellow color, with a stripe on top of them to use your favorite accent color. Even window controls have changed icons and now look, well, more familiar if you're coming from a certain popular operating system. And look, before you panic, you can still revert to the older Linux Mint theme, including the colored folder icons and all the green everywhere. You can, they're still there. That default look is also complemented by a new cursor theme called Bibata, which is thicker and loses the traditional pointer tail. But again, you can still use the previous ones if you prefer, which I do. Sounds received an update as well and are now using Material Design V2 sounds from Android. And okay, I have to say it. All these efforts to make Linux Mint look more modern and less green and gray and drab they are really appreciated. I always felt that Mint's default looks were holding it back in the eyes of potential switchers to Linux, seeing that Mint is often the number one distro people recommend. Even if you could change those looks after the fact, defaults matter. But this change, this is controversial. First and foremost, because it's very clear that it aims to emulate how Windows looks. The default blue, the manila folders, the window controls, coupled with the traditional Mint Cinnamon layout, which is a carbon copy of what Windows 7, 8 and 10 offered. It all makes for a pretty simple to understand goal. Mint has always been the number one distro recommended for Windows users. And this move makes it even clearer that it's the goal it sets out for itself. And I'm okay with it. I mean, if I can point anyone who wants to switch to Linux, 
to a distro that looks good, is stable, robust, and kind of emulates what you already know, even if it's only on the surface, if you're coming from Windows, then I'm fine with it. It works. And in that, I think Mint 21.1 accomplishes that goal, whether it was their design or not. It now looks very much more like Windows, more modern, and I personally really like these looks. But it's also a big dilution of Mint's visual identity, and I can understand why people are a bit annoyed by it. But in the end, what is important is what Linux Mint represents, and that's the perfect gateway for potential Windows switchers. And with these changes, Mint is an even better gateway. So I think goal accomplished. Now, the second big change in Mint 21.1 is its Flatpak support. Mint already supported installing Flatpak applications, but it wasn't really designed around it. Well, that's now the case. The Update Manager, Mint's tool to update your applications and your system, now supports Flatpak applications and runtimes. So you can update everything in one place and you don't need the command line or a separate app store like GNOME Software. And Mint Software Manager, their app store that only handles application installs, not updates, also gets the usual drop-down menu to let you pick between the Flatpak package or the regular deb package from the repos. Mint uses Flathub, by the way, so you should get everything you need from there. It's great to see Mint adopt this packaging format. They're one of the biggest user-facing distros and having them support Flatpak better is a good step. Flatpak isn't perfect, but it's very, very clear that going forward, it will be the default packaging format for all beginner-friendly and user-facing distros. So that support is welcome. It's really not perfect though, as searchers in the software manager will return multiple instances of the same application, which might confuse users compared to just letting them ignore the packaging formats or pick it on the application's details page. Another change is the way Mint handles drivers. First, the driver manager, the tool that lets you see if there are drivers you could install and install them, well, that now runs in user mode, so you don't need to enter your password just to open the application. If you're offline, you will also get a dedicated screen to let you know why the app is empty. And you can also use USB drives to install drivers. For example, if you plug in a live USB, Mint will be able to detect it and offer to mount it so you can install drivers from that. That tool also now supports DebConf, which means that installing proprietary NVIDIA drivers with secure boot enabled should be more robust. Mint still comes with Cinnamon as its default desktop environment, and the desktop got some changes this time around as well. Cinnamon 5.6 comes with a new corner bar, which is another callback to Windows default layout. It's a small vertical applet stuck to the far right of the default panel. Hovering over it allows you to peek at the desktop by hiding all windows, complete with a blur effect if you want. But you can also click that corner bar with the left mouse button or the middle mouse button and configure what which click does between either showing the desktop, showing the desklets, showing the workspace selector or showing the window selector. That little applet replaces the previous show desktop button that was on the right of the main menu. In the context menu, when right-clicking on the desktop, you can now directly access the display settings, and the default desktop icons were cleaned up with the removal of the home folder, the computer, the trash, and the network icons. Since these are all available from the file manager, there is no reason to have them on by default, but you can restore them in the preferences if you want. Now, this reasoning also applies to all desktop icons. Since everything is accessible through the file manager, you should just not have any desktop icons at all. Or you should have as many as you want. It's your computer after all. Nemo, the file manager, also gets a few changes, like showing the dates in the list view in a monospace font, improving the path bar by letting you click on the current path to toggle the location URL bar, while navigating to a different folder will bring the path bar back. Smaller changes include a search entry in the shortcut settings, so you can look at all the various shortcuts you might want to change. Preferred applications are now featured by categories. You can configure the duration for which notifications will stay visible. The themes list is now sorted between dark and light themes and current and legacy themes. And you also get window placement mode back in the window manager. Those are all pretty small tweaks, but they should still make the experience a little bit nicer. 
Now still that themes list should really just be split between a theme selector and an accent color selector because that current list is getting very crowded. Oh, and also Mint won't bug you for your password as often as it once did. For example, uninstalling a Flatpak app that you installed for your user and not the whole system won't require a password. Same goes for removing local shortcuts and local applications you only installed for yourself. And Synaptic and the Update Manager will also remember if you entered your password recently, so they won't ask for it for every single action. And finally, you can also now configure the mouse pointer theme and size for the login screen. If you use Warpinator, the file sharing app on a local network, you'll be happy to know it is now more secure, and the Web App Manager now lets you tweak more settings when creating a web app, especially the presence of a navigation bar in the window and if you want to browse privately for that web app. Not many changes to the default apps in Mint 21.1, but then again, it's not like they were missing a lot of features. As per the Mate or XFCE variants, they get the exact same changes for the themes, the cursors, the applications, and the desktop. The only thing they don't get is the corner bar, the display entry in the right-click menu on the desktop, the file manager improvements, and the reorganization of the various settings pages. Now, there are the usual caveats for every version of Linux Mint. It's still based on Ubuntu, although you do have an edition based on Debian, just in case, which means that if Ubuntu messes up at some point, they have a backup plan. They still remove snaps from Ubuntu, which is also pretty good for a desktop distro. Snaps are great on servers, but on the desktop there is no reason to prefer them over Flatpak or regular packages. There are still no touchpad gestures for laptops, which sucks. And the big thing is still no word on Wayland support. X11 still works for the moment, but Mint hasn't started working on Wayland at all, as far as I know. Or they've been super quiet about it. They use a window manager based on Mutter, and they use GTK, which are GNOME components, which do have Wayland support but there's still going to be some work to be done for Cinnamon itself to support Wayland and implement portals and global shortcuts and desktop and window sharing, all that stuff. And not having any idea if the Mint team is going to work on Wayland support or not is not great. Wayland, as a protocol, is now feature complete with the recent addition of real fractional scaling, and X11 isn't getting more secure or isn't getting any new features at all, so I don't think Mint wants to be stranded as the only last distro and desktop that doesn't support it. Apart from that though, Mint is still Mint, despite its branding changes that really make it clear they want to be the number one distro for Windows switchers. They retain their main goal, which I always took to be, provide tools and graphical utilities for everything you can out of the box, provide a simple and logical experience, customization options for people who want to work differently, and generally a robust and stable experience for day-to-day -day computer use. And whether they're green, blue, pink, or yellow, they still provide that. They're still the number one distro I would recommend to anyone moving from Windows, maybe even more so now. So, Mint 21.1, it's now become basically Windows as the default desktop experience, but it's still a fantastic distro that I still heavily recommend. And if you don't like the new look changes, don't worry, you can revert all of them. All the themes are still there, so it's no problem. Just like it's no problem to run Linux on any of today's sponsors' devices. Because Tuxedo is a company based in Germany, and they ship worldwide a big range of desktops and laptops that ship Linux out of the box. So don't bother buying a Windows computer and trying to install Linux on it, because you never know if things are gonna run right now or in the future. When you buy from Tuxedo, you know that Linux is going to run well on it. And they have devices for every price point and every use case. Whether you want to game or just a lightweight laptop or a workstation, they have it all. And they're all customizable, upgradable, repairable. You can even have your own custom keyboard layout, laser etched on the keys of your laptop, or your own logo, laser etched on the lid. So check out the link in the description below if you want a device that runs Linux and you want to support Linux's development. 
tuxedo device are really great. So thanks for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, don't hesitate to like, to subscribe, to turn on notifications, to write a comment. And if you didn't like it, there's always that dislike button. It still works. And you can write me a comment to let me know what you didn't like exactly. And if you really enjoy the channel and what I'm doing here, you can always click on the super thanks button underneath this YouTube video. There's a PayPal link in the description. And there are also links to my Patreon memberships and YouTube memberships. Both get access to a weekly podcast where I talk about Linux, tech, open source, my personal life and the channel. And you also get to vote on the next topics that I'll cover on the channel as well. So thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye.